Hello and welcome to the Airgun World podcast, brought to you in association with Crackshot, the South West's premier airgun centre and ranges. I'm Matt Manning. With me this evening, I've got my good mate and Airgun World contributor, Rich Saunders, and also Eric Irish from the podcast sponsors, Crackshot. Good evening, gents. Evening. Hello, Matt. Hello, Eric. If we kick off with our usual sort of quick catch up as, as to what we've all been doing in our sort of shooting world over the past week or two. Uh, Rich, what, what, have you, what have you been up to shooting-wise these past few weeks? I seem to have been shooting rabbits morning, noon and night. I don't know what's happened near me. The, the rabbits have been breeding like rabbits, I think. And <laughs> I picked up a couple of new permissions. And for once, when yeah, I'm sure you've had it before, new permission and they say, I'm inundated with rabbits, rats, whatever. And normally you go down and there's nothing there. The two that I picked up have just been carpeted with rabbits, um, you know, and it's it's good to start with because they're you know, they're pretty sort of fresh and naive, never been shot before. Um, so I've been making hay while I can until they kind of wise up a little bit, and things slow down, you know, in, in on future trips. But yeah, lots of rabbits. Um, I've been out um, today putting up some new squirrel feeders. Uh, Make the minds of carpenters made some fantastic squirrel feeders. The ones I made, we've got the six-inch nails sticking out of them and <laughs> holes in and everything. So uh, I put those up, filled them up, and I'll be back on the squirrels next week, I think. Eric, mm. what about you? I, I imagine you've probably been finding your feet again off the back of the uh, British shooting show. I know you were run absolutely ragged there. Yeah, the, um, the show was really good for us, but there's a lot of preparation to get leading up to it. Then you've got the event. And a lot of people forget the amount of work that goes in after the show as well. Following up mm. with orders, all the um, everything's you got returns and everything from the show, and it's so. I, thus, I've not had very much shooting at all for the last month. Should be we're well, back on it soon. There'll be um, there's a lot of pest activity appearing. The um, we've got to try and do a little bit to protect, protect some of the songbirds. So um, soon be back on it. Good stuff, good stuff. And I know it, it, it looked like it was a brilliant show for you. It looked like the, the, the crowd of, of punters that you had around the, the, the crack shot stand, it was sort of five or six people deep every time I tried to catch up with you. So presumably it was a, a good show for you and the team. It was a great show. We, um, we, we were well up on last year on sales. We, have, we doubled the size of our stand. So we had more stock. We had our um, all of our stock in. We had storage in behind as well, so we had it much more accessible. We got a great position in amongst all of the um, main manufacturers and wholesalers, and um, overall, really, really happy. And we booked for next year as well. Brilliant. What sort of things Brilliant. were people so, buying, Eric? They were buying. I mean, it started off as most shows are. People looking. And you, you, you try and second guess what people are going to want, even though you're out of your usual area and you've got a complete different audience. And it was just a bit of everything. You know, we had people, mm -hmm. some people come on and buy their first gun from us. Some people come back from, they bought something from us last year. They were back again. And um, we had um, somebody buy three guns from us. All wow. good hmm. quality, you know, Top end um, air rifles. So um, overall, it was great, and we've had lots of um, follow up calls and sales and email since as well. It looked like a what felt like a good show this year. It seemed to be a, a good mix of shooters there. Loads of air gun shooters. I think there was lots for them to see as well. It it, it did feel like a good one. And like you, I I've, I've been recovering from the the aftermath of the show. Just the general tiredness uh, from having too much fun on a couple of nights of the show. But no. It, it was a good one. And shooting wise, for me, it's it's been much of a muchness for this time of year, really. A lot of rat shooting. I, I spoke last time, Rich, about the fact that I was controlling some rats in a in a big garden. Mm. That is that's wrapping up now. I think that the problem is pretty much dealt with. And I'm I'm gonna quite miss it because it's been really nice shooting rats and it's quite close to home as well, but from the comfort of a summer house or a log store have been my two sort of main lookouts. Um, vantage points in this They're garden. Not so far from the kettle either. Exactly. Exactly. So it's been really comfortable, and I'm going to quite miss that. And yeah, apart from that, 
a lot of gray squirrel control. Um, I've been trying out a new feeder, actually. It, it features in the latest air gun show, which should be out by the time people see this podcast. And it's made by a chap called uh, Keith Watson, who's mm. got Keith's high seats. So he's a really practical, really talented bloke, great at rustling things up, unlike me. Um, and I've been trying out one of his feeders, handmade metal feeder, tough as old boots, really good capacity, so I'm not constantly refilling it. Um, and also, it's got a flap on the feed tray, which I've always been a little bit, suspicious of and wondering whether squirrels will still be that eager to get at the feed uh, the feed if they've got to go to the trouble of opening a flap first well i really needn't have worried about that they've they've been just absolutely demolishing the contents of this feeder i've had a couple of brilliant sessions with it um like i say one one of them's on the current episode of the air gun show heck of a lot of squirrels queuing up at that feeder so yeah so so far so good and i and i've shot it a few times too and it stood up to that well so seems to be a a good tough well-made feeder the good thing about lids on a feeder and i've found this a a number of times is that the number of times i've nodded off in my hide and then woken by the lid the sound of the lid flapping back down again it's like a little alarm bell yeah you get that tap it it saved me a, a number of times yeah yeah well, I mean, I, th- I think it's saving me a lot of money in terms of peanuts. I mean, we've spoken before, but it's nice to see songbirds mm. visiting the feeders. But when you get big birds like woodpeckers and jays, um, and some of, some of the estates where I shoot, they don't mm. want jays controlled, and I so, you know, respect that, leave the jays alone. But those birds are taking sometimes 30 or 40 peanuts at a time, um, and obviously mm. stashing them somewhere, presumably. And you add up all those visits, mm. and it starts to get mm. really expensive. And I've noticed for that, the, the first and second time I shot that feeder, I think I shot between 9 and 11 or 12 squirrels each visit. So let's say there were 20 squirrels visiting out of the feeder, probably more over the, the period of those wow. first two shooting sessions that I had. The, the peanuts weren't going down at the rate that I would have usually expected for that many squirrels. And obviously that's because... Mm. I'm not losing so many to all of the birds that would usually be helping themselves. So, yeah, there's not so much interest from watching the birds when I'm sat in the hide, but it's definitely saving me a few quid. I've got pheasants on on one of my permissions, and they just get up on the feeder, and they'll just sit there for 10 minutes just stuffing their faces. And they're so stupid that if you kind of shout, cough, wave things out of the hide, they don't take any notice you have to physically get out of the hide and run at them before they run them across then you scare everything else away as well <laughs> so i think i might have to invest in a i've got lids on my new on my new super duper feeder so i might have to um get my chisel yeah, out and my, g- give it and give it some, and put some on but yeah on, on about daft pheasants there's, yeah. there's one shoot where i do a lot of gray squirrel control and we've got one it's a big blue drum proper pheasant hopper it, it pulls more squirrels than any of the other um, hoppers on this shoot so we we leave it going now most of the year because it's just it's an absolute banker but there's one pheasant that loves it around this feeder it's a really handsome cockbird and you could literally pick it up it blows my mind that it hasn't been had by a fox yet to be honest with you because i i know that there are foxes that haven't been dealt with on this shoot i've, I've seen a couple of them um and the fact that there's this i, w- I wouldn't even say half tame this absolutely tame pheasant and it's been there. Oh, it was it was there last <laughs> summer. So it's been it's it survived the shooting season. I assume it probably doesn't fly, which has been its greatest strategy in surviving the shooting season. <laughs> and now it's just still there, hanging probably. out around the feeder, I should say, um, having a great life <laughs> and get, getting fat on on the the feed that we leave there because it's such a good such a good feeder for squirrels. Probably on its toes. If it's shooting season, it's here's the first gate to go. He's up. He knows the score. Yeah. He's gone. Never to be seen again that yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a runner, not a flyer. So, yeah, mo- moving on and, and uh, a quick look at the latest issue of Airgun World magazine, which looks like that. It's the April issue. Rich, your group test in this, issue, this issue was bolt action PCPs, wasn't it? Bolt now, action rifles. Yeah. Bolt action rifle. So yeah, we, we've yeah. all become so accustomed to, to side levers over the past few years. I think a lot of us have kind of yeah. just just 
push the bolt action aside a little bit, but what, what was it like sort of going back to the, the bolt action style? It was great to watch. And you're right, you know, side levers have become the fashionable thing to have. And I think my understanding is that they've become more popular because they're easier. They have mechanical advantages over bolts when it comes to high power FAC rifles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, outside the UK, a lot of markets are high power. So it makes sense for manufacturers. But yeah, and, and, and a lot of the, what I found was that a lot of the bolt action rifles that are on sale today are really sort of quite old products. You know, there are just not many new rifles coming through that are bolt action. I, I, I ended up looking at the, um, the Walther RM8, you know, bolt action, the Air Arms S410 that's been around, what, 20? I think they launched that in, in the year 2000, uh, and the BSA R12. One, one newish rifle that I managed to get hold of was the, uh, the Remington Vought, which, um, it's a really interesting rifle, and people may have seen it already, but it, it basically has the, the air cylinder around the barrel. So, and it has this massive, great big, kind of chunky, Lee Enfield chromed bolt action. And it's a real pleasure to use because the bolt feels like you, you know, you're sort of loading up a 303 and poking your head over the top of a trench kind of thing. And, um, yeah, really interesting rifle. Um, yeah, less than five, around about 500 pounds, a little bit less. Uh, and I say it has that sort of big full bore hunting rifle, like, you know, you're out shooting rhinoceroses or something with it. It really is an attractive rifle. And interestingly enough, although that cylinder around the barrel isn't a new thing, I think there's an Artemis, I think the M30, don't shoot me if I got that wrong, was one of the first rifles to have that configuration. And now, obviously, FX have brought out the DRS as well. Mm. So it seems to, I don't know whether we're going to see more rifles um, with that kind of configuration, um, but you know, it, it shot superbly well, especially for, uh, for, for a budget rifle. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been looking at. And it was a real joy to sort of, because I think, you know, I like a side lever, but there's nothing that gives you that kind of tactile, mechanical interaction with a rifle than a, than a well machine. It bolt. feels purposeful, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I really enjoyed that one. Eric, for, for you, I mean, obviously being in retail, presumably there is still a, a, a strong demand for the bolt action type air rifle. Yeah, there are. There's, um, I mean, obviously the side lever are becoming more popular, but you always feel it's, you feel like it's more a positive action by pulling a belt back, hearing it click, mm. and then pushing it forward again and locking it in, and you feel like you've you're making a proper shot as such it's not no the side mm. lever actions are all very really slick it's just one finger yeah. slide it side lever back push it forward but um there are you know people out there who genuinely have prefer a bow action you know they've they've straight mm. traded in their side lever action because they want to feel a bit more positive with and they maybe even reduce their silencer capacity as well just so they get a bit more feel for it instead of a what is a very efficient quiet um hunting air rifle where they, they just want something mm. a bit more feel to it and I, the, the shooting experience has been slightly sterilized hasn't it and i think that that's the, the risk you run if something yeah. becomes too refined and funny enough i've been reviewing or, or shooting quite frequently recently the walther rm8 uh, the, well, the Rotex RM8. We, we've got it again. It's in the review section of the latest air gun show because we're trying to look more at guns that are a bit more affordable and a bit more accessible than the sort of absolute top end kit. Mm. I've mm. got the UC version, which I've had for years, and I think it's brilliant. But the one I've been shooting is, I think it's called the Classic, which is the, the beach stock. So it's got the wooden stock, longer barrel. And oh, I yeah. must admit, it's much more fun and engaging cycling that bolt it's just i don't know there's just something a bit more practical and it feels a bit more real i mean i've seen people in our range and they've they've been up there and they've they've shot away and they've got their side lever with a huge silencer on and they sort of pulled the trigger and a hole's appeared in the target there's no um <laughs> you don't yeah. feel you've achieved very much so they, they want a, a bit more they want a bit more from it obviously there's no recoil but they still want to feel they've fired a gun and, and not just mm. punched a hole in a bit of paper. 
I think you're right. It, it seems to me like that, like a good bolt action sort of it kind of makes the whole process of taking a shot more complete. You know, a side lever you can almost sort of do it with your eyes shut, and you you've kind of operated the side lever almost on automatic pilot. But with the side with a with a bolt action, you know, they they do require several different movements. You've got to lift it up. You've got to lift it back. Put it forward again, down again. There, there's more to it, and I think that sort of is more involving and more engaging in the whole taking a shot process, which is what I like. I've got a, um, a BSA R10, and I bought it second hand. So Mark II bought it second hand about seven years ago, and I don't know whether it's been tuned in a previous life or something, but I've not had it tuned. And the bolt action on there is just so delightful to use that you know it almost makes missing something worthwhile just to cycle it to take another shot you know it's just it just makes that rifle for me and if it was a side lever it wouldn't be it wouldn't be so, so much fun to shoot no you're right no, i think you know talking about it making you think more about the whole shooting process it's almost like it's halfway to having a brake barrel or under lever springer because you've, you've kind of gone through this rigmarole it's it's yeah. then making you sort of register the fact that you've got to do your bit before you go through that process again, rather than just flick, flick. Um, however, yeah. there is also a lot to be said for the quick, slick side lever. It's horses for courses, isn't it? It's a little bit like fly fishing. I mean, you can, you know, if, you, if you're a course fisherman, then you might sort of whack out a lead, you know, 50 yards and sit there for a couple of hours. Or if you're a fly fishing machine, you're, you're constantly casting. And for me, fly fishing is as much about the action of casting is it is actually catching a fish. And I think you know, a bolt action just sort of pre- prolongs that whole process a little bit longer and makes me feel more involved in, in what I'm shooting. That's just, just me being a bit weird. There's many people, have, they've got their side lever gun, they've got their bolt action, and they've got their springer as well. So yeah. they whatever mood mm. they're in, they can pick up yeah. and yeah, make use of what they've got and enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think I think Rich and I fall into that category. Uh, we, we still can't make our minds up as to what, what we want, so we have to have a bit of everything. Exactly. Um, but move it, moving He's on, Eric, board. obviously you're, you're here representing Crackshot and you're based in Newton Abbott in Devon. Tell us what people can expect to find and to see if they drop in and visit you. And if, if you pop in and see us, we're... You can. Um, we're on the industrial estate. You can park right outside the building. There's no walking through the town. Um, and we we've got, you know, all our lads. They're all air gun enthusiasts. They know what they're talking about. And we've got a huge display of air rifles there. We've got not every make, but we have got a lot of a lot of the main manufacturers are on display. And we've also got a huge selection of um, like pre-owned guns as well. You know, a lot of air gunners, they'll have a gun for six or 12 months and they'll change it for something else yeah. just because they can. And uh, or they might move it up into a more of a target shooting sport and they'll, they'll move on, to, you know, what they've got previously, trade it in. And um, so we've always got, there's always a few good bargains that we had in the pre-owned section. And that's constantly changing. You know, the we, we try and update our pre-owned section on the website weekly if we can. And you could always tell when you've put out a, a um, big selection of pre-owned, the, the phones can just light up with just people mm. looking at um, grabbing a bargain somewhere. It's quite a bit cheaper than getting that brand new one. And a lot of them are only six, 12 months old in really good condition. And um, mm. yeah, we put a warranty on them as well. But what we also do is once you've decided on what you want, we can help you to uh, help you with scope selection as well. Even if you've got your own scope, bring it along. We'll, we'll, if you want help, we'll, we'll give you a hand to mount the scope. We'll check your eye relief. We'll, we'll get you up on the range with sample packs of pellets. Make sure that you, when you leave us, your gun is all set up, all zeroed, ready to shoot. Yeah, because you, you've got a couple of ranges there, haven't you, Eric? Yeah, we've got the 20-meter um, indoor range. So it's all, you know, you can zero at 20. Yes, I'd love to have a long range, but that is the size of the building. Um, you've got the um, pistol range, which is more designed for, like, BB pistols. 
And then um, you've also got the electronic simway shooting simulator as well, which is great oh, okay. for if, if you want to have a practice at clay shooting, bit of you can do all the Olympic disciplines in there, clay shooting. Wow. You can even do a cowboy shootout. <laughs> so there's always lots to do there. <laughs> And um, what what are what what are people buying at the moment, Eric? What are the big what are the big sellers for you, air gun wise? The biggest seller since since its launch was the Brillcock Ghost. Right. That w- went crazy last year when it launched, and we well a year before now, and it just kept on it's kept on selling. They brought out a few more versions, and mm-hmm. um, it you know I'm getting some of the original ones traded in now for a limited edition. Um, we did really well on the um, Air Arms, the new Air Arms XTI. That was been mm-hmm. a great seller for us. I think we've since the launch we've sold about thirty of them. Wow. And um, that's quite they... a specialist piece of kit, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. that's a, a serious. That's not a knock around in the backyard and yeah. shoot a few squirrels air rifle. That's that's a Formula no, no, One no, car. What about optics? Are you are you shifting much in the way of of traditional glass, or are people getting more and more into the digital scopes now? We're still doing a lot of traditional. You know, the, all the field target boys they, they want something big with a huge magnification, and mm. um, they're always you know they're always popular. Um, just the you know the good quality. Hunting scopes are always good with a side focus on, and um, they're they always they always shift. You know they're always moving, but they, mm. but we do sell not many. We sell some digital, but it's not um, it's not massive for us. But it's you know some of its add-ons onto their original scope, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. because you know if a lot of these digitals now they're all day and night scopes, but. They're okay in the day, but they're not. Um, they're never going to be. Well, not at the moment. They're not no. as clear as a no. traditional scope going forward. They might be. They, they have improved a lot. I remember using the old ATN two, I think it was, and marveling at how great that was sight picture wise. And then I don't know if there's an ATN three, but the next one I got anyway was the was the X sight four, and the difference between the two and the four was literally night and day. And yet, you're right. There's, it's still a compromise on glass, though. Tell me, Eric, how how do you go about what what sort of influences you in terms of the brands that you're going to uh, stock in the in the shop? Do you is it sort of trade discussion, or you kind of look at forums? Are you sort of plugged into what people are talking about? What what makes you just because you can't stock everything? Obviously, I know you've got a huge range, but you can't stock everything. What what kind of criteria do you do you apply before something makes it on the on the crack shot shelf we get asked to stock a lot of different brands who are constantly being chased could you stock this can you stock that but some of it is it's all mm-hmm. too similar to something else you've already got there's, mm-hmm. there's no point we obviously you've got to look to see what competition is stocking you there's, there's no point um keeping a, a similar range of guns so we we want to keep good quality guns that are not going to cause us, cause us too much grief going forward. Obviously, we put our lifetime mm. warranty on anything over four hundred and fifty pound, but we want to be fairly sure then that that air rifle is going to have a good life and it's not going to cause us too many problems. You, you offer like lifetime servicing as well, is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. We'll look after it yeah. as long as you know, as long as you look after. It, your gun. It's not been wrapped around the gate post or left it soaking wet. You know, mm. we'll look after it. We um we've got good service teams and um we can do we can look after most guns now. We had a gun in the other day that was one of the very first ones we sold in two thousand and fifteen. First time we had it back. Just needed um a new set of seals. On it went again. So um we haven't seen the uh, you know we, we may not see the chap again for another 10 years to tutors like me and rich and probably to a lot of people who were tuning in your job having your own gun shop sounds like an absolute dream come true but 
I, I imagine it's not without its challenges. What what are the difficulties? You know, the, the, the things that you have to overcome in your line of work. You've got obviously get employ the right staff. You've got to find the people who can do the work, who know that who can talk the talk as such. Um, obviously, we're open seven days a week. That's always a bit challenging as well. Um, you've got to look at supplies to make sure that the, the, the shop always has to look stocked. You don't want to end up with um, something that looks a bit empty in places. Um, it, but overall, it's great. The, the time absolutely flies. You know, we're into March now, and really, just it seemed two minutes ago it's Christmas, and um, now it's coming into the exciting time of year now. It seems to me, Eric, one of the, the biggest challenges must be the fact that, you know, you obviously have your stock level, but you're reliant on the distributors and the man, and they're reliant on the, the, the manufacturers to, to feed stock through to you. And yet, I'm guessing there must be times when you get customers coming through the door and say, I'd like one of these. And you know that there just aren't any in the supply chain for a while. Now, that must be a big frustration for you, I should imagine. Yeah, it, it it can be, you know. If but if we we only ever tell any customer what we know, if if we know it's going to take a month, we tell them it's it, it's going to take a month. I'm not going to say it's going to take a week just to get an order, and I'm not going to add anything to it to say it's going to be two months, and um, you know, and then hopefully we'll get it earlier. I just I just tell people what I know, and. Supplies have improved over the last the last twelve months. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's getting better. Through COVID, was a bit of a shocker. Overall, we're we're, we're pretty good on supplies now, uh, but there's so much variety out there. You know, they some people. Oh, well, I can't have that. I'll have this other one instead because there's always something else, something to yeah. look at. And I can imagine, aside you know from the the odd difficulties that you need to overcome, it must be incredibly fulfilling because you are literally making people's dreams come true you know they've been sort of looking forward to getting this kit they're excited about it they've either seen it on the internet or in the magazines you, you must see a lot of happy faces in, in the shop a lot of people come in they know what they want they come in they walk around and they change their mind they see something that they like even more because they didn't <laughs> see this one and then they've um and then they've they've gone out of a shop with something completely different than what they came in for, but they're even happier than what they thought they were going to be because they've they found something that much better. Great, great. Well, if, if we if we move on now to the questions that we've received from readers, viewers, listeners, Rich, do you, do you want to kick us off with one of those? Yeah, I've got a really good question here from Nick Jones, and it really made me think. Uh, and he asked very simply. Um, who was or is um, your your shooting hero? You know, who inspired you to get into the sport? And, you know, apart from you, Matt, obviously, <laughs> um, there's all sorts of people that, that inspired me. And, and so, you know, Matt, let me throw that at you first. Is, that, is there any one particular person who inspired you? I'm going to be really greedy. I, I can't narrow it down to less than three. First one would be my granddad, Hawker. It was a herdsman on a farm. They had a little tied house on the farm uh, where my grandparents lived. And granddad would milk early in the morning and then later on in the day, and there'd be a lot of downtime in between milkings. And hens, had hens in the bottom of the garden, did a lot of gardening. And inevitably, you might get the odd mink around the hens or you might get a rat or what have you. And there was always a gun or guns at the ready. Um, this is probably going back to the 80s now. So the house was in the back end of nowhere, right out in the middle of nowhere in, in Somerset. Um, it would be nothing to see a shotgun, a rimfire, or an air rifle, or sometimes all three, leaning in the corners of the living room. Uh, again, d- different times, but it just it just fascinated. If I I'd go there, and my eyes would be popping out of my head. Um, and, and it never crossed my mind, even as a youngster, that that I could touch these guns. I didn't, didn't see it as like you know I, was, I couldn't wait to get my hands on them. But I just find them fascinating. And yeah, gr- Granddad loved being outdoors. Obviously, worked outdoors. 
at night he'd be out lamping rabbits and he was a great storyteller always put a, no doubt put a lot of top spin on stories you know, once he saw my sort of little eyes boggling i'm not convinced exactly how much truth there was in some of the stories that he came out with but he always made his shooting trip saying incredibly exciting brilliant fun and from a really young age probably six or seven i just could not wait to be able to go out shooting with granddad which, which eventually i did but then more so the, the big catalyst for me was my uncle who still lived at home at nan and granddad's house who was my uncle kev um quite a young uncle he was he or he is only about 11 years older than me so say i'm sort of now 10 or 11 he's in his very early 20s and i used to stay at my grandparents whenever i could I, it was just a magical place staying on the farm and thankfully kev could see this sort of these sort of embers of this fire that that needed to be gratified and you could tell that i was not just excited but i had a genuine and still a fascination with the countryside and wildlife it wasn't just about you know, shooting targets it was it was about nature and just being out there and kev saw that and, and thankfully nurtured it and used to let me tag along shooting with him plinking out in the backyard when you know, it was literally once i was old enough to cock a break barrel air gun and, and strong enough well, I, I probably used to lean it against a post or something because i wasn't very old but yeah 10 or 11 years old i was out shooting in the in the, the, the garden of the, the farmhouse and then a year or two after that i was tagging along going out pigeon shooting squirrel shooting ratting at night lamping rabbits um and it was just magical and i really to this day i'm just so grateful that kev had the patience and the kindness um to let me tag along to show me the ropes um yeah just yeah, gave me that amazing opportunity so they were the the two really close to wow. home. i'd say granddad sort of lit the flame kev definitely fanned it and then for me the the, the sort of air gun hunting hero other than friends and family john darling his his first air yeah. rifle hunting book for me kind of that to me is the blueprint of what air, air rifle hunting has become as if, if you want to call it a sport, um, it, it just set the, the framework of the, the, the conduct, uh, the attire, the equipment, the, the basis of needing field craft skills o over expensive equipment. Once you've got those field craft skills, mm -hmm. obviously expensive equipment, uh, equipment becomes a lot more useful. But yeah, for me, the, the, the wonderful tone that John Darling would write with in his books and in his magazine articles um just it felt like you were there and again he was somebody that, that cared about and was interested in the whole thing the, the, the countryside the, the relationships between the various species and the seasons and the crops and the trees and how if you could crack that code or, or get halfway towards cracking that code it would make such a massive difference to your, your success as a hunter so Sorry for being so greedy and indulging myself mm. so much, but they're, they're my my big three. And without, I think, any one of those, I certainly wouldn't be sat here now and I wouldn't be doing yeah. what I am now, be it in Air Gun World or on the Air Gun Show. So ma massive thanks to all three of them. Mm. How about you, Eric? What, yeah. what got you started? Um, a bit similar to Matt. I grew up on a farm. My dad gave me a Bakel single barreled shotgun kick like a right. mule but um i used to go along on the local it was a little small local pheasant shoot i used to go along there beating take my um i'd take my collie dog with me as well they normally have a fight with all the other proper gun dogs there as well <laughs> that'd upset a few and um then once i was going there i also had all that grown then for um rabbit control squirrel sh shooting in, in through the woods and um, I had acres and acres of ground where it was, you know, a mm. lot of the shoot members, were they were only really interested in the pheasant shooting, whereas I could go all the rest of the year for anything else there. It progressed on from there. We had an air rifle for um, pest control mostly. We'd be out for ferrets as well. We used to, we'd be out on our push bikes. We'd go for miles down to, round the farms with your nets, your ferret, then come home with 
all the rabbits as well. It's quite a load then with, when he's all done. And um, back home for dinner, back on the farm in the, eve- in the afternoon then. It just progressed on from from there. And I, yeah, as most people know, I'm more of a shotgun shooter than I am an air gunner. But it's always great to get out with the air gun. And um, you can do, you know, it's you can do so much more on the pests with it. It's mm. it's quiet. It's safe. The combination of the two works really well for me. Unlike you two lucky guys, I I didn't have a, a relative with a farm to grow up. I was sort of grew up in suburbia, but I had a a school friend who um, whose parents were quite well off, and they had a big house with with uh, with fields and everything. And um, kind of ten or eleven, we used to shoot air rifles in his you know on his land at tin cans and things. And then I picked up. Then I got hold of a copy of Air Gun World, and and like you, Matt, there was John Darling in it, who was writing like like the sort of the the crab tree of air gunning. Yeah, you know, just painted these beautiful pictures of what of a different side of the sport to the side that I've been exposed to, and just opened up this whole new world for me about what an air rifle could do. And um, I think you know, if there's one, per- if it, if it wasn't for him. I don't know if I would still be shooting tin cans in my mate's garden. You know, I'm, I'm sure his parents would be annoyed if I was, but um, <laughs> you know, he opened up this whole new uh, universe of what was possible with an air gun and the ethics of hunting and the fact that you could hunt with an air gun. And there's one picture. I, if I close my eyes, I can see it right now. And, and that was the moment. And it was he was shooting um, Corvids, and there's a photograph of him in Air Gun World um, with snow on the ground, um, kind of with his HWAT over his shoulder and his super moonlighter scope and what have you, and mm-hmm. a couple of crows in the foreground. And this photograph just, it spoke volumes to me. And I think from that moment onwards, I thought, I want to do that. you know. And that was you know, 40 plus years ago. So that, that for me, he was my, and I, and I suspect a lot of people watching this will be going, yep, John Darling, John Darling, in the same way as we have as well. I've got a question from Michael Stokes. So if this is quite a good question, actually, if you had to choose just one type of air gun hunting to do for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, Rich, do you want to kick off with that one? I would say probably rat shooting. Um, And the main reason for that is that um, you can be a little bit lazier doing it. Um, and also I tend to do a lot of my rat shooting in the company of a couple of mates. So it's as much a, you know, a, a night out with my mates as it is doing pest control. The fact that they're combined is great. Now I do an awful lot of shooting with my mates, other kinds of shooting as well, but rat shooting, I think no one ever, ever criticizes you for shooting rats. You never have those awkward conversations with people about, Oh, why do you shoot those little fluffy things? You know, they're rats. Everyone hates rats. And you know that they probably of all the species that we shoot, they are the most dangerous, probably to humans. So yeah, so for me, it would be rat shooting. Great to get out in the woods as well for squirrels. Mm. You know, you've got to do some, you've got some proper field craft, and um, you've you've just got to get your um, get a feeder out there and pitch, make it. Just make it work. Get it in the right place, and um, pick your spot, and um, sit and wait, nice and quiet, nice and peaceful. Watch the world go by. You see all sorts of um, wildlife when you sat out there. It's amazing what yep. will, um, will walk right up to your feet. Sometimes we had a, um, a Reeves pheasant on um, on a, in our a wood where I shoot. He actually gets quite aggressive if he knows you're there. And he would walk right up to you and he's just scratching at your feet. And I thought, oh, if I move, he's going to have a go at me. But <laughs> I just sat there and he walked on past. And um, wow. and he was he was like six, seven feet away. He did not know I was there. And wow. yes, you shot a few squirrels, but you've also seen everything else which is going on as well. Squirrel hunting is a is a big one for me, but I think rats would just about win it out for me night nighttime rat shooting there's something really exciting about it 
Um, it's got an app, especially on the on a farm. I so said recently I've been doing a lot of it in the garden, which I've been enjoying. But out on a farm at night, it's something really cozy, especially if you're tucked up in a, in, a, in a barn and the weather's cold and rough outside, and you're in a, you're in a snug barn, and there might be some sort of livestock snorting away in there as well. And you're in this little cocoon, cocooned in darkness. If you've got a thermal spotter, obviously you're opening up this whole other little world, and you've got your night vision scope. And, and I, yeah, and there are owls hooting in the distance. I just find that really exciting and really engaging. And it is just completely immersive. I, I feel like that when I'm out doing that, it's the center of the universe. Like nothing, nothing else seems to exist. And that's probably the main reason why if I could only have one gun, it would be a sub-12 air gun, because I don't think I could forfeit my rat shooting. So, yeah, I, I think it would just that would just pip the squirrel shooting for me. Um, I've got I've got another question. Actually, Dave, David South emailed me a little while ago after he got back from the British shooting show. Uh, he'd seen loads of amazing kit there, but it, it pr- prompted quite an interesting question from him. Uh, looking at all the technology now that's filtering into air gun shooting, you know, we've got optics that that can uh, that have ballistic calculators that can adjust point of aim after they've established the range to the target. And he was saying. How long is it going to be until we see the air pressure of the gun also on the screen that we're shooting through? And then at what point do we just put, you know, we're, a lot of us are shooting from support now on tripods or what have you. At what point are we going to just put a gun out on a remote control tripod, sit at home and operate our, our gun from a screen? So in a roundabout way, what he was saying was, mm. has the tech, the, the electronic side of shoot uh, of air gun shooting gone a little bit too far what 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 do you think to that eric i mean it goes down to what what do you want to do if you just want to sit at home that tech will probably um will probably appear but will you get the same buzz as going out in the barn shooting those rats being being out there with a couple of mates shooting some rats going in the woods shooting some squirrels being being there and doing it as against um, just watching it on a screen like a bit of a computer game. Um, there's no there's no buzz in that. You you know I I yes it, it, tech will always move on, but there's always going to be the, the place for you know traditional um, air guns. Yeah, I, I think Dave is right. I mean, he's put his finger on 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 the fact that you know we now have electronic action rifles. You know, we have um, rifles that will, you know, day state, you know, some of the technology and some of the day state rifles is incredible. Um, and if when you start looking at some of the, the, the digital scopes now, you mentioned you know, ballistic calculators where you, you know, you enter in details about the pellet that you're shooting, the speed you're shooting at, and it will calculate the, the, the hold over or hold under for you. Now, are incredible things, you know, range finders inside your scope and what have you. Um, I think it comes down to, you know, for, for, for me, someone who spends an awful lot of time pest controlling and an awful lot of time hunting, you know, for me, there's a sort of a clear differentiation between the two. When I, when I go out pest controlling, I feel that I owe it to um, the landowner on whose land I'm shooting and doing a job for to have the best possible equipment that I can get my hands on. Um, because it's just going to mean that yeah, I am more successful. Um, and that will mean that, yeah, I do use a scope with a ballistic calculator. I'll use FAC rifles. I'll use night vision, rangefinders, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but if I'm out hunting and I'm doing it for the sheer joy of being out in the countryside, shooting something for the pot, then, yeah, I'm completely with David, you know, and I'll often take a, a springer with me. Um, and uh, you know, a four by forty scope, a pair of binoculars, and a handful of pellets. You know, it's what I used to do all those years ago when I was, you know, an aspiring John Darling. Um, and I think that, you know, as, as you say, Eric, it comes down to what you want to do. And you know, and the, and the other thing is, you know, the, the, these, this technology is not a compulsory purchase. You know, it, it's it's not something that you have to have. And if your enjoyment is an old Springer. Crack on with an old spring. It. If you're someone who likes to fiddle and twiddle with all the buttons and knobs on these um, high tech scopes and, and, and rifles, then you know that's 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 fine as well. It comes down to what you enjoy. But for me, I think technology is a good thing because because it gives me the option 
um, or the potential to be as good as I possibly can be when I have to be. I, th- I think I pretty much agree with that. And I think, like you say, it, it, shooters will ultimately regulate it based on what they want and what they want to get from their shooting. And like you, and, mm. and most of the time for me, I want the, the most precise, humane way of, of killing whatever I'm pointing my air rifle at. I want it to be a swift, clean dispatch. I want to be doing you know, that. I owe that to my quarry. I owe the doing the best job possible. I owe that to the landowner. Um, and most of the time, that means having fairly sophisticated kit or engineering situations that permit me to get really close to my target. Um, but mm. there come times when your kit gets so sophisticated that it becomes a bit of a pain and you start to strip it down a bit. And like you say, sometimes it's a treat to go out with a springer and simpler kit because you've started to feel a bit bogged down with tech. I mean, I know I sometimes feel if I have to update the firmware for another night vision scope, yeah. I'm just going to give it up and get a lamp because it starts to just become really mm. frustrating <laughs> or remembering to keep plugging stuff in and charging it up. Oh, and, oh I've, I've charged my scope, but I seem to have forgotten to charge the batteries for my illuminator and I haven't charged my thermal spotter either. It's like ah, all these little niggles. Most of the time, it's for the best. Every so often you feel it's a bit much. And I think it's that sort of human, enough is enough. The line is always drawn somewhere in far, insofar as how advanced and complex technology will become. And I think for most of us, it boils down to the joy of being there and doing it, as Eric said, and that the appeal wouldn't be the same if you couldn't get out there, smell the farm, hear the owls, and, and feel the cold. Uh, so I, I, I yeah. don't think it will ever become yeah. a, a completely remote, removed virtual experience. I certainly hope it doesn't. And I think by and large, that the, the amazing tech that we get to use these days for those of us who want to, it, it, it's most of the time it's a gift. One final question, Eric, and this is a really tough, unfair question. Your your desert island air gun. So you're, you're stuck on a desert island. You're only going to shoot one air rifle or only have one gun at your disposal however long you're on this island what are you choosing to be your desert island air rifle i, I mean i always like a somebody look a traditional looking gun um, i would my brain would go with a um always loved the day state huntsman regal nice boat action but obviously it's been superseded by the revere lovely smooth lines Nice and lightweight, nice hot, sh- high shot count now, lovely gun. And um, that would probably be my favourite. But if there was a but, <laughs> if I had a... You've got two um, desert island air guns. I have got two, yeah. I've got, I've got, two, I've got two islands, all right? Yeah. <laughs> On the other island, it would probably be a uh, Steyr Pro X. Ten shot, semi-auto. Puts a smile on your face every time you shoot it, but um, but no, I, I still prefer the um, nice traditional looking walnut stock with traditional lines. So yeah, it would, it would be the um, go back to the day state. Good choice. Fair enough. Th- th- thank you for for narrowing it down to to two and and, and possibly one. Well, I, I want to to wrap up by saying to everybody, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Airgun World magazine or better still take out a subscription. Uh, You will get 13 copies delivered to your door. We have subscription offers for podcast viewers and listeners. Um, So there's a discount and also subscription includes free shooting insurance. You can find out about that on airgunshooting.co.uk. But if you're tuning in on YouTube, We'll put the details in the show description. Rich and Eric, thank you for your time. Uh, everybody tuning in, do check out Crack Shot. We want to thank them. They're our podcast sponsor. If you can get down to Newton Abbott, take take a look. Otherwise, the website is crackshot.uk. Dave and Terry will be back with another guest in a fortnight. And me and Rich will be back two weeks after that. Thank you for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.